for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Miss Ramey, legal department, Britannia Casualty and Life. Oh, yeah, Miss Ramey. Thanks for calling back. I just wanted to get something straight. Uh, if a murder is executed, does his policy pay off? Well, that's an unusual question. As far as I know, yes, but we've never faced the situation. Well, put on your makeup. It's liable to happen any minute. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Britannia Casualty and Life, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of Stuart Palmer, the man who wrote himself to death. Expense account item one, $123.42 air and miscellaneous travel expenses from Hartford to Chicago and the Cook County Jail. Well, you can make up your own mind about him, Dollar. He's like all those writers. If he isn't guilty, he's crazy. How are you, Lieutenant? Oh, hi, Markowitz. This is Mr. Dollar. Hello, hi. Hi, Mr. Dollar. He's an insurance dick. He wants to talk to Palmer. Call him out, will you? Sure thing, Lieutenant. Hey, Palmer, your mother's here. I'll see you on your way out, Dollar. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lieutenant. Here's your boy, Mr. Dollar. You'll have to talk to him through the bridge. Stuart Palmer? Yeah. My name is Dollar. Britannic Casualty in Life sent me out here. I understand you're in some difficulty. Is there anything I can do to help you? You didn't come here to help me. You came to investigate my new policy. Now, look. I don't need your help or anybody else's. I paid my first premium. That's all you or the company need be concerned about. They're concerned about the fact that you're being held on suspicion of murder. That doesn't affect the policy. Have you retained counsel? That's not your business. Thanks for the cooperation. Nice to meet friends in a strange city. You can have them, Markowitz. Thanks. Well, Dollar... Lovable, isn't he? What have you got on him? Oh, not much. Some whiner was killed in the Clark Street pool room. Palmer was holding one of the cues. We pulled him in with about 14 others. When are you going to release him? We're not sure. He's been in before, you know. Tell me, what's the matter with him? Who knows? He's a writer. Crime stuff. Hangs around the West Madison District a lot of the time. Calls it research. Does he still have that Kenwood address? Now, wait a sec. Uh, yeah. 5715. Well, I hope his wife is jollier than he is. Oh, Mr. Martin, I was... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were somebody else. I am. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, I'm sorry. We have all the insurance we can use. I said investigator. I want to talk to you about your husband. Oh, come in. Why do you do this to him? I know why. It's like he says. You're all after him. You don't like him because he's a genius. You don't understand him. You'll never understand now, him. Now, wait a you minute. You can try all you want to. As Stuart says, when one human being does something better than another human being, that's when they attack him. Well, go ahead. Look, Mrs. Palmer, I'm on your side. I'm not the police. Oh. Now, why don't you sit down? I'll explain the whole thing to you. Come on. Oh. Yeah, that's better. Now, your husband took out a $100,000 life insurance policy last week. Well, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Mrs. Palmer, please. This week, your husband is arrested on suspicion of murder. There, now, you see? You don't know anything about him, and already you're accusing him of the most awful thing. I am not accusing him of anything, Mrs. Palmer. I'm just trying to help. I talked with your husband a little while ago. He wasn't very cooperative. I'd hoped you would be. Well, you put him in jail, and then you're expecting to be cooperative. Hmm... Does he have a lawyer? Yes, of course. Mr. Martin. That's who I thought you were. Well, how does Mr. Martin feel about this? Well, he's been very nice. Stuart isn't worried. Stuart knows that Mr. Martin can uh, spring him any time he wants to. Mm, I see. What does your husband write? Books? Well, he used to write for the radio. But as he says, it's a very limited medium. So one morning he went to his agent and tore that contract up right in his face. And that very day he started to write his play. 140 pages. Uh -huh. With real people in every scene. He took every one of them from life. Is the play about crime? How did you know that? 
Well, I met your husband doing a little research in jail. Well, they put him in jail because they don't understand. As he says, they don't put a doctor to bed in a hospital because he's doing research on a dangerous disease. People don't know good from evil. That's what's wrong. They're afraid of the truth, and that's what's good right. He practically lives with his subject. Criminals. Yes, he studies them. Nobody can write believably about something unless they're familiar with it. That's the, the sacrifice he makes. You don't get to see much of him, do you? Well, his work is infinitely more important than I am. But as soon as his play is produced, they're going away together. Atlantic City, you're permute. The manuscript has been in New York for six months now, so it, it shouldn't be long before he hears. What has your husband's income been for the past six months? Well, there hasn't been much. But great art is often born of poverty. But $100,000 insurance policies aren't. Who's this man, Neil Beasley, your co-beneficiary? Co-beneficiary? Well, if you're going to sit here and be insulting, perhaps you'd better leave. Well, perhaps I'd better. Um, you mentioned an agent. What's his name? George Michaelkoff. He's in the England building. Crazy. The guy is crazy. You can't do business with a guy like that. Art, he talks. Everything's got to be art. Spends his time with bums, and he calls it art. Hasn't he done anything for six months, Mr. Michael Carr? Not with me. Well, let's face it. Not with nobody. You know, he could have been a good writer, this boy. But he was too arty, not commercial. Then, boom, he's got to write a play. And where is it? Probably in the bottom drawer of Hallstein's desk. And it's going to stay there. Here's a copy. Take it along and read it. Thanks. Now, what about this research he does? Research? Is that what he told you? <laughs> I had to go down to the county jail and bail him out. Twice. That's what washed me up. Someday they're going to catch him with the goods on him. You know, maybe it started out to be research, but it ain't now. Well, how did it start? With a guy named Neil Beasley. Neil Beasley? <laughs> oh, you heard of him, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's the boy. He took Palmer under his wing, and that's where he still is. I don't know. Maybe he can't get out. Uh, Beasley came up to the office with Palmer once. What a character. Where does this Beasley hang out, you know? Who knows? Nasty neighborhoods. Expense account, item two, 80 cents, cab fare to a nasty neighborhood. After a lot of questions and bad bourbon... I came across a character who called himself Roscoe. Roscoe was the walking who's who of the district. When I mentioned the name Beasley, he swallowed his drink, wiped the back of his hand over his mouth, and leaned over the table toward me. Beasley. Beasley. Let's see. Beasley. Come on, here. Here's something to stimulate your memory. Well, yes, of course. Beasley, Neil Beasley. Been a friend of mine for years. Slipped my mind. Getting old. Beasley was born in Cincinnati of well-to-do parents. They say he attended Harvard, but perhaps it's only a story. You know how stories start. Get the history. Where can I find him? Any number of places. If the racetrack was open, you'd find him there, but the racetrack ain't open. There is his place of residence. Where is that? I don't know. But he must live somewhere. Obviously. What would you suggest? You familiar with the Atomic Tavern up the street? No, oh, I'm a stranger in town. Peoria? No. You have the face of a Peoria salesman. I don't know. Something in the eye. Yes, well, the Atomic Tavern up the street. Thanks, Roscoe. You never did say where you were from. Hartford, Connecticut. If you're ever in town, look me up. Four blocks away, squeezed between a delicatessen and a shoe parlor, I came upon the Atomic Tavern. It exploded just as I arrived. And stay out. That's no name to call a lady. Oh, I come right in, sir. Come in. Anybody with a civil tongue is welcome, sir. Thanks. Yeah, boys. Mm -hmm. Neil Beasley around? Eh? Who wants him? His name is Johnny Dollar. I'm a friend of Stuart Thomas. Eh? Well, you tell him that. He's at the back table there. All right, boys, come on, what do you have? Don't oh, bother me. Don't me anymore. Your name Beasley? Mr. Beasley. Who are you? Mr. Dollar. What's the business, Dollar? Insurance, investigation, then. Can I sit down? 
I'm working for a company that holds a policy on the license of Stuart Palmer. Insurance racket. I wonder how it started. I suppose somebody back in Rome bet Julius Caesar ten drachmas he wouldn't live through the 15th of March and won. What do you want with me? Well, I'm looking for somebody who'll make some sense. Maybe you're it. I understand you're Palmer's beneficiary. That's right. He's a good boy. Yeah, but he's not a good risk. The company insures a radio right I cannot hear and then he's a petty criminal. What's your problem, Dollar? Why don't you cancel the policy? Well, I will if I can. Tell me, what got him started? Well, put yourself in his place. He spends a lot of time around here learning so he can write good stuff. He writes good stuff, so good they won't buy it, so he falls back on his education. That's logical, but illegal. Oh, they'll get him. They'll get me, too. It's fate. The bumps on your head, the lines in your hands, the stars, destiny. Who can stop it? Well, it's quite a philosophy you got. I was looking toward the front of the building. I hadn't seen him come in, but it was Stuart Palmer. He was standing at the elbow of the bar, obviously looking for his friend. When he spotted me, he started for the door. Oh, sit down, Dollar. That's my arm, Beasley. Sit down and leave him alone. The cops released him. Just leave him alone. Let's go, Beasley. Oh! Hey, 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 the furniture. Lay off, will you? Let's put your door By the time I got outside, he was half a block away, heading west. I knocked over several West Madison Street characters, and then it suddenly occurred to me that the only reason I was chasing him was because he was running away from me. I was 50 feet behind him when he rounded a Walgreens drugstore on the corner. For a second, I lost him. Then I saw him. He wasn't running. He was turned toward me. Palmer! Don't! Don't! The crowd! I bent over the newsboy just long enough to see that he was dead. And I started after Palmer again. There was no mistake about it. He wanted that policy, and he'd kill to keep it. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, the screen's sophisticated, caustic Mr. Belvedere, alias Clifton Webb, We'll swap quips with Bing Crosby on the Groner CBS show this Wednesday night. CBS cordially invites you to hear this great show that promises some of the best laughs of the season when it comes your way on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. Mildred Bailey, the rocking chair lady of popular song, also will be on hand as guest star. So remember, be listening when Clifton Webb, Mildred Bailey, and Bing Crosby get together tomorrow night. Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I lost Palmer in the next block. If daylight had held for a little longer, maybe I could have stopped the whole thing. I looked at my watch. It was 6.05. The Hartford office was closed. I headed back for a phone in the Walgreen drugstore. I got to the corner just as the police and the person of Lieutenant Carrigan pulled out. Dollar! What the devil are you doing here? Look at that kid, Carrigan, lying there. If you hadn't let that maniac out, the boy would still be hawking his papers. Hey, wait a minute. Back off. What are you talking about? Who do you think did it? Palmer. Palmer? Are you sure? Yeah, he was shooting at me. What'd you let him out for? Oh, look, Dollar, there are laws. I told you earlier we didn't have much on him. He was clear. Well, he's sure not clear on this one. Huh. Kid only had three papers left. I think you better tell me what happened, Dollar. Well, let's go away from here. Yeah. Oh, hey, folks, why don't you go home? Come on, move, huh? I don't know what there is about people. They're just glad it wasn't their kid. Well, here's the tale. I came down here to find a guy named Neil Beasley, a friend of Palmer's. Palmer showed up in the joint. When he saw me, he made a dash up the street. I took out after him, and when I got to the corner, he opened up. The kid was standing next to me. After the gunfire, I went after Palmer again. Believe me, I I wish I'd caught him. Yeah. Sergeant? Yes, Lieutenant. Put out a general on Stuart Palmer. All the dope's in my office. Why would he want to kill you? That's a $100,000 question, Lieutenant. I'll be in the drugstore. Got to make a phone call. Hello? The 
Mr. Sandal? Yes? Sorry to bother you at home. I'm on the Palmer case out of your Hartford office. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? That's right. Uh, how are you making out? Well, things couldn't be worse. Your only move is to cancel the policy, sir. Uh, how soon can you do that on good grounds? Well, I uh, couldn't get word from the East until tomorrow afternoon at the earliest. Well, if you can't do it tonight, just forget the whole thing. Well, the police have put out a general alarm for the policyholder, dead or alive. And the odds are on the bad side. Oh, well, all right, Dollar. I'll do what I can. I'll get on the phone to Hartford as soon as I hang up. Good. I won't keep you waiting. Bye. Expense account item four. A dollar eighty cab fare back to Mrs. Palmer's apartment. On the way... I suppose I should have been worried about the $100,000 worth of policy, but that didn't seem to bother me. There was the newsboy, who never knew what hit him, and there was Palmer's wife. I was going to have to tell her about it. But I knew, even before I got to the apartment, that she'd never believe me. I don't believe you. Of course you don't. And you don't want to. You don't want to believe anything bad about him. You want to just go on complimenting yourself on being married to the greatest man on earth. But you're way wrong. Where is he? I don't know. And you can't make me believe you. Why would he kill anybody? Well, my guess is that he's doing it for you. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. He wouldn't do anything wrong, even for me. He took out an insurance policy that he couldn't afford. Why do you think he did that? I don't know. I never understood about business. Well, he sure got you. Some people have collie dogs, and he's got you. He comes home, pats you on the head, so you'll look up at him and tell him how wonderful he is. You know why? Because nobody else will. You just don't understand. You just don't understand at all. How long has it been since he treated you like a woman? Bought you things like candy, flowers... When was the last time he spent an evening with you? Why are you saying these things? Well, I'm trying to tell you that he failed, both as a writer and as a husband. Don't you see? He's trying to make it up to you. He wants the police to kill him so you'll collect the insurance. That's a lie. Where is he, Marion? Hello? Yes? No, he's here now. Why do you say that? No. Stuart, where are you? He hung up. (laughs) Well, look who's here. I wish Palmer was as easy to find as you are. You won't find him here. Does she know where he is? No, he just phoned her and wouldn't tell her. Well, looks like a long night. Yeah. For her, too. Mind if I ride back to the Madison District with you? That's quite a theory, Dollar. What happens to a guy to get him in a mess like this? I don't know. Burned too many bridges, I guess. Made a stand with his agent. Told everybody he'd show him he was right. Now he can't do it. I don't know. Maybe I've been in homicide too long. I used to think a lot about things like this. You know, wonder about what started these characters, what got them to the place where I'd have to go after them. No more. Their problems aren't mine. All I worry about now is how to get them without getting anybody else hurt. You've got a nice, simple job, Lieutenant Carrigan. Yeah. I was thinking of that. You want him alive? The insurance company does. I hope it works out for you. I can't take any chances. We always try to save him for a trial. But if you're right about this one, he'll come out with a gun. Those are the kind we have to stop. You know, this could turn into a very unpleasant situation. The lieutenant was kind enough to drop me at the Atomic Tavern. The place was empty. The sirens had frightened most of the clientele out of the precinct. All except one. He sat in the same position, at the same table, 
with what looked like the same glass of beer. Hello, Beasley. Mr. Beasley. I was expecting you. Sit down. Thanks. How is the insurance business? Well, sometimes we sell too much. <laughs> you know where Palmer is? Surely, always know where Palmer is. He tells me things he wouldn't tell anyone else. You may not care, Mr. Beasley, but you just made yourself an accessory to insurance fraud. Not unless I tell the police where he is. And then your company is out the hundred grand. And you're in ten. I'll tell you the truth. I don't want that money. I don't want a penny of that money. It looked good at first. He wanted to give his wife the break, offered me ten grand to help him out. How did you help him out? Well, take right now, for instance. I could have tipped the cops twice a minute since it happened. In fact, I was supposed to. Cops would have killed him. Wife and I would have collected our money. But I can't do it. Isn't it a little late for boy scouting? No. No, not if you could talk him out of it. Where is he? No cops. No cops. Just as soon as I finish my beer. We walked down Halstead with the red street cars rumbling by and the fruit trucks and the chicken wagons. I didn't notice the name of the street we turned west on, but a block and a half later, we stopped, two doors away from a basement barber shop. Well, that's where he is. You're crazy to go in there. Are you, uh, are you staying out here? No. No, I'm going in. <laughs> but I'm crazy, too. Really? That's why you should never listen to a guy like me. Farmer's got nothing to lose. How much do they pay you for getting killed? Come on, if you're going, let's go. Okay. Farmer. Farmer, it's Beasley. Let me in. Uh, good work, Neil. Bring him in quick. You've got a good line, Beasley. Mr. Beasley, so good I believe it myself. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, Palmer, it's a bad deal all the way around. What do you want to do, make history? You won't go down in any books. What's got into you? You helped me lay out the whole thing. Oh, yes, it looked good, but it won't work. He's right, Palmer, it won't work. I put through a cancellation request on your policy. Uh -huh, but it hasn't gone through yet. If it had, you wouldn't have come in here. It's no good, Palmer. Even if it doesn't come through, they'll fight it in court after you're dead. We've got too much against you. How far will they get without your testimony? You aren't going to be around to give it. Well, that's no good either. If you kill me, that'll clinch it. Oh, come on. Use your head, Palmer. You've got a chance. The newsboy is only a second-degree rat. There was no premeditation. You're trying awful hard to save that company of yours a hundred thousand bucks. Listen. Listen, there isn't a commission big enough to make me come here. All right, then why did you come? I don't know. Maybe, well, maybe because way back in my mind, I thought to myself... I can get to this guy. Maybe it was your wife that made me come. I just saw her, Palmer. You know, you aren't doing her any favors by getting yourself killed. She loves you too much. You can't buy a thing like that off with a hundred grand. They're coming. I didn't tip them. They must have followed us down. It doesn't make any difference how they get here. Just so they come. Well, watch it, Dollar. Stay away from me. Nobody's going to stop me now. Uh, this is what they all wanted like a big literary agent with the big promises. Great play, he tells me. Yes, and the old friend. They'll cut the story out of the papers and they'll save it in the desk drawer. Poor Stu, they'll say. He could have been a good boy. Well, all right, they can save it. It's going to pay off. That's what counts. It won't pay off and you know it. The only guy that wants it this way is you. Because you haven't got the guts to go on. Armor, we know you're in there. We'll give you 30 seconds, Palmer. I'll be right out. Palmer, it's waste, Palmer. It's for nothing. It's no use, Dollar. He's going to do it. Better lie down on the floor. Stuart? Stuart, are you in there? Marion. Marion, get away from here. I want to talk to you, Stuart. Open the door. No. Come on in here. Marion, what, what are you doing here? You're the lieutenant. Don't do it, Stuart. I don't want money that way. Wait a minute. Did they make you come in here? No, no, I wanted to come. Don't do it, Stuart. Please. Good. Goodbye, Marion. Stuart, don't go. Stuart, come back. Let go of me. Oh. Stuart. Get down on the floor. Oh. 
Come on. Oh. There's nothing you can do. Stop, Palmer. Stop. As you know, Palmer's policy was not canceled before he died. But I'm sure that with a staff of legal geniuses employed by the Britannia Company, you'll come out all right. A soft judge gave Beasley 60 days for attempted insurance fraud. And that was it. Expense account item six, same as item one, transportation Chicago to Hartford. Expense account total, $635.24. Oh, almost forgot. <laughs> Item seven. Thirty-five cents. Tip to Western Union boy. Telegram from Marion Palmer. Contents? Thought you'd like to know. Stewart's play accepted for production on Broadway. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role. It is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Keith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen in the Harry M. Popkin United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in tonight's cast were Lorene Tuttle, Larry Dobkin, Bill Boucher, Bill Gray, Jack Crucian, and Herb Butterfield. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Jack Crucian and Herb Butterfield. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle.